Welcome to the Reason of Theology Show, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, on a Tuesday evening, joined by my co-host, uh, William Albrecht, Eric Ibarra, Father John, and also our esteemed guest, Abbot Trifon, who is an Eastern Orthodox abbot and priest. How are you, uh, Father Abbot? I'm still upright. Welcome to the Reason of Theology and Show. 75, that is a miracle. Evening, joined by my co-host. And, and I think we're getting a little bit of feedback from somebody. I'm not sure. Um, Yes. who that's coming from but i hear i hear myself in the back um, how are you uh, maybe turn it down do one of y'all have uh the show going on in the background by any chance i think it's gone now so uh, <laughs> i think i think it's been fixed i don't hear it anymore i don't know if y'all were able to hear it but i, I was so it's i could y'all. hear it Okay. <laughs> well, anyways, let me go ahead and introduce you, Father. Father is uh, the Reverend, very Reverend Abbot Trifon. He is the Egomen of All Merciful Savior Monastery on Vashon Island. Um, he also has a daily blog entitled The Morning Offering and a show on Ancient Faith and Faith Radio by the same name. He also has a book by the same name on Amazon.com. I'm going to put links to all this there in the description so y'all look for it. But I also want y'all to check VashonMonks.com, V as in Victor, A-S-H-O-N, Monks.com, because not only do they have uh, Father's uh, stuff there, but also they have, as I understand, their very own coffee blend. Is that right, Abbott? It, we have actually uh, five different coffees, but it's all under the banner of, of um, Monastery Blend Coffee. That's awesome. You, and now that you mentioned I think I've heard of this before. Uh, it, it's been out for a while. Is that is it's that been, right? Yeah, we've had it for many years. Yeah, I need to get me some. So everybody check that out, VashonMonks.com, and go and support the monks there. But anyways, um, Abbott, let, let me ask you a couple questions. Today we're talking about Eastern Orthodoxy and monasticism, so the beauty, beauty of Orthodoxy, but especially when it comes to monasticism. And I want to ask you this to start. Um, how does the Orthodox monastic way of life differ from just the regular Orthodox lay way of life? What what what, what is really involved in Orthodox monasticism? Well, monasticism in the Orthodox Church is, refu- is referred to as the angelic life. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, to live in imitation of the angels. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it's also a challenge to all Orthodox Christians to live in imitation of the angels. So it's not just monks who are called to the angelic life, but all Christians are called to the angelic life. Excellent. Yeah. And what, what are some of the practical things that you also do that are different? I mean, you know, imagine you all have daily prayer. You, you pray uh, seven times a day. Is that correct? Um, we don't. Our, we do the same, probably the same length of prayers that, say, Benedictines or Trappists would do. But right. we don't have them divided up that often. So we our day here starts with the each monk has his assigned cell rule. Okay. which is a spiritual reading and his private prayers done in his cell. Um, and then at six o'clock, we gather in the temple for, uh, for matins, which is about an two and a half hours, two, two hours and 15 minutes to two and a half hours. Oh, wow. And then when that is over with, we, uh, we go to the trapeza and each individual monk can have whatever he wants for breakfast during non-fast periods, you know, boiled egg or a piece of toast or a cup of monastery blend coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, we can, then from that point on, each monk goes to his assigned um, obediences. Mm. And so some, like for instance, Father Nicodemus that was here a few moments ago, uh, Father Nicodemus runs our online gift shop bookstore, mm-hmm. and uh, and he's our tech person, which is why I called him in at the beginning. Um, and then we have uh, Father Paul, who is the co-founder of the monastery, Hiram Monk Paul. He's the other priest here. There's just the two of us, myself and Father Paul are the priests. Um, and Father Paul is the one that deals with the financial end of things. And, uh, and he's the one that uh, goes off island uh, once a week to get supplies that we need. <coughs> and, so you're uh, on a legitimate island. <laughs> we live on an island. Wow. Yes. That's awesome. Now, you were talking about fasting there. Um, 
I, I know the rules for orthodoxy when it comes to fasting are, are pretty rigorous to begin with, just for the lay lay individuals. I imagine it's even um, even more disciplined for the monk. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, very much so. Um, we, of course, like all Orthodox Christians, we are meant to keep the Wednesday and Friday fast throughout the year. And then we, uh, the first three days of Great Lent, we have a, 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 what's referred to as the strict fast, which if one is capable of it, uh, we don't have any kind of food, uh, just simply water for those first three days. Um, and then uh, uh, we have, the, the year is divided up into four major fast periods. Mm -hmm. uh, each coming before major feast. So there's the Dormition fast um, that precedes the uh, the Theotokos, the, the commemoration of the Theotokos' uh, uh, repose. Um, we have the um, uh, the Apostles' fast uh, before the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul. We have uh, the Nativity fast. And then we also have the, the Great Lenten Fast, which comes before Pascha. Great Lenten Fast is the ser most serious of them all. It's essentially 40 days of, of absolute fasting from all forms of like dairy and meat and fish and um, eggs, all of that, cheese. So we have that period. So essentially about half the year, we Orthodox, uh, if we keep the fast periods, uh, are vegan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, another one of the things that I, I've been curious about here is, you know, talking about these fasting regulations and how, you know, monks are called to a higher standard. Are there ways in which laity are able to uh, learn from some of the things that you're doing and incorporate that into their lives. How how can how can we live as lay monks? In other words, <laughs> is well, there such um, thing? One of the things that I think is very important is the uh, is the prayer rule. And mm -hmm. generally, a prayer rule is given to someone by their spiritual father or mm -hmm. confessor or spiritual mother. And the prayer rule. Uh, is what uh, separates the individual from the rest of the, say, a parish, uh, because the uh, everyone is expected to do the morning and evening prayers and the pre-communion prayers that are found in one's prayer book. Mm -hmm. uh, but the prayer rule um, it often goes beyond that. Uh, it, it involves, you know, assigned spiritual readings. Uh, it, it involves... Um, uh, say punctuality of starting your your prayer rule at a certain hour uh, ending the day with your prayer rule uh, and these are all things that connect the individual uh, to uh, the monastics of the church mm -hmm. and oftentimes uh, people will come like we get lots of visitors to the monastery and 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 so many of those individuals uh, seek, guidance from one of the monks here as to uh, what they might do to deepen their life in, in prayer and uh, make uh, orthodoxy more uh, important to everything that they're doing in the rest of their lives. The problem is that the, the importance of having a prayer rule is so that we do not uh, turn our uh, our faith into something that's just a Sunday go to meeting sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that, that rules every aspect of our lives from from the day from the beginning of the week to the end of the week. Now you had also mentioned that you know there's some similarities between your uh, prayer rule in the Benedictines, just loosely. Um, you, you're you're not in. Orthodox monks generally are not part of any particular order. Is that uh, correct? I've, I've often heard it likened, or um, some have said that it kind of goes back to St. Basil, uh, the, the prayer rule and the discipline and the way of life. But from what I understand, there really is no particular order when it comes to Eastern Orthodox monasticism. Is that correct? Yes. We do have Western Rite Orthodox. Okay. Uh, which a lot of people don't know about. Um, right. So um, Western Rite Orthodox monastics 
uh, tend to keep to a strict Benedictine rule. Mm -hmm. And they even wear the Benedictine habit. Mm -hmm. um, but I would have to say that, you know, I've over the years, I've been a monk for over 40 years, and I have had lots of friends uh, within the Roman Catholic Church. I still do. Um, I'm very close to the Capuchin Franciscans in the Bay Area. Okay. Uh, whenever I'm down uh, in the San Francisco area for meetings with our clergy at our cathedral, uh, I often will stay in Burlingame at the Capuchin Franciscan house because the superior there is a friend of 37 years. Oh, wow. And so, you know, and I have over the years, starting when I was in college in Oregon, I had a I had a close friend who was a Trappist monk, Father Jerome, mm -hmm. at Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so um, I've always had friendships. Uh, I have a friendship with the present uh, abbot uh, uh, Jeremy at Mount Angel Abbey, which are Benedictines. Um, I, I have always felt this connection with other monastics. Mm. Um, and, um, and I think that it's been my experience that when I'm with these other monks, whether they be Roman Catholic or Orthodox, that we have a, a special connection, a special bond mm. uh, that that is it has its roots in our commitment to living the angelic life. So you see a lot of similarities then? I see a lot of similarities, and, uh, and I feel very comfortable among them. Wow. Um, what, one of the things that would differentiate the Orthodox, as you referred to a moment ago about, we don't have different orders. Yeah. So for instance, uh, uh, a Roman Catholic that feels a, uh, a, a calling to uh, the eremitical life as a hermit might uh, join the Carthusians or, or the Camaldolese. Um, and that, was, that will be his life for the rest of his uh, monastic uh, life as a, as a Christian. Mm -hmm. But we Orthodox, um, you know, I, I am very much of a, uh, I guess I would have to say that I feel that I, in my, my heart of hearts, I'm an evangelist. Mm -hmm. And so uh, before the pandemic, I traveled around the United States and Canada on a regular basis, giving parish retreats. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's when I am thriving, I think, the most because I love people and I love being out among people. Um, I gave the, uh, the priest retreat uh, for the Archdiocese of Alaska uh, last, uh, last year. Um, and then I gave a retreat in Calgary, Alberta for 100 women. And then I gave another retreat the, the month later in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, so okay. I miss doing all that. Yeah. Um, and sort of the way I, I keep on top of it is I, I do it the, the daily blog, The Morning Offering, um, which is hosted by Ancient Faith Radio. I do a podcast. The, the blog is, is seven days a week. Uh, the podcast is Monday through Friday. And then I try to do a YouTube video once a week, uh, sometimes having my homilies recorded and sometimes uh, I have a recorded where I'm sitting now or maybe even in our forest. And it's all a way of um, sharing my faith with people in a world that has forgotten God. That is incredible. That That is awesome because we need to hear more from the monks. We need to hear more from the religious, um, those of us who are living in the secular world. Um, you know, Abbott, I have one more question for you, then I want to pass it on to my brothers here. Um, there's so many other things I'd like to ask, but I want to make some time for them as well. Um, so one last question. What is it like being an abbot? What, how, how is that? What, what does a day in the life of an abbot look like? Uh, well, it, the words come to my mind, there's no rest for the wicked. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, so um, I'm sort of like the Benedictines and the Trappists. Abbots don't get to retire. Okay. They're, they're elected for life. Yeah. They're appointed by their bishop for life. And uh, so uh, I don't know when I, when I, uh, when I, when my monks find me, asleep in the library in a comfortable chair 
I don't know whether they're excited that they, oh, finally we'll get another Abbott, or, or, or they're just going to wait and see whether I wake up or not. I, <laughs> but, um, I guess I would have to say that one of the key elements of, of, the, of the role of the abbot is he has his, his monastic council. And so any major decision that an abbot would make that would, uh, that would Im impact the community uh, should be, doesn't necessarily have to be, but it should be with the consultation of his senior monks. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is that um, the role of the abbot, we're not like, um, we're not like, uh, we're not about, boss being bossy with everybody else. Uh, I respect my monks. And when I give them an obedience, I let them do their obedience. I don't, uh, uh, I don't follow them throughout the day to make sure they're doing their job because I know they will. I trust them. Mm. And, uh, and everyone has comes to the table with different gifts. We all have different gifts. And so just like in a parish, just like in a diocese, and I think that, that just as a bishop should first and foremost be the father to his, to his priests and to his people, uh, and um, probably most important of all, the bishop is called to be a servant, just as Christ was a servant. Uh, when, when Christ um, uh, appointed the apostles, he didn't appoint them as overlords. He appointed them as missionaries, and pastors and fathers to the flock. So yeah. my first role is as a father to my monks. Mm. And, uh, and, and I, I am fortunate that when I was raised, my dad was a really good father to me. And he imaged um, what, a father, what fatherhood means. And, uh, and so I'm grateful for that. There's so many that I talk to in this day and age that we're raised with very difficult fathers and sometimes abusive fathers. And I was very fortunate that God gifted me with the dad that I had. Uh, so a lot of, of the way I govern this community and how I see myself as the abbot is, is really a mirror image of what my dad was to me. That's an incredible witness. No, that's that's amazing that uh, he's he's impacting the monastery in that way. That's uh, very encouraging for us fathers here on the show. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, let me pass it over to my co-host here, William, and then after that, um, Father John is going to ask you some questions, and then uh, Eric will engage you. So, but again, thank you so much for answering my questions, Abbot Trefin. Father, Father Abbott, thank you very much for uh, for taking time out of your schedule to to join us. We very we feel very blessed uh, by your presence here. I, I know one one uh, one question would probably be on many people's minds that are that really are are fascinated by the Eastern tradition. Um, is is, is would you describe being an abbot similar as being similar to the way? we look and study the lives of the desert fathers would it be in any way similar at all yes um when i first started my monastic life um i was still in the world so some 40 years ago i was part of a of a uh i'm i'm, I'm a recovering psychologist <laughs> it's a lifelong process and i'm still not through it yet but when I first became a monk, it was with a desire to deepen my my life in Christ and uh, and to uh, and to fill this void that I felt in in the secular world. And um, and so I didn't expect yeah. that I was going to have any other monks under me. It was not something that I. Uh, that I expected was going to happen at all. It was something that um, I, it just happened. It, God called me to this and it was confirmed um, by my bishop. And, uh, and then we founded this monastery. Father Paul joined me years later. And now we have uh, six of us here. So we're a very small monastery. 
We live on, on an island on 16 acres in the middle of a forest surrounded by the Salish Sea. So it takes uh, 20 minutes to get here by ferry from West Seattle. And uh, it's a great blessing for us, especially given the, the latest uh, happenings in Seattle in the last number of months. We're, we're happy to have this giant moat around us to keep us safe. <laughs> No, no doubt, no doubt about that, Father. And I can guarantee you that all of us here are praying, uh, praying that you continue to have that uh, that kind of safety. I want one thing that really does um, fascinate me is the incredible prayer life and dedication and devotion to uh, to God that uh, that surrounds and really envelops your life. I, I wonder also, as um, as an abbot and as one that prays so fervently. Is there a special kind of devotion that maybe you have that is even stronger toward our Blessed Mother now? Or um, what, what kind of a recommendation can you give to maybe those that don't have that kind of a prayer life? Do you recommend praying more, spending more time in meditation? What, what are your thoughts on, on that in particular of the devotion you may have now that maybe you didn't have before to our Blessed Mother? Well, first of all, I was raised Lutheran, and uh, I used to uh, sneak into Roman Catholic churches in Spokane, uh, where I was born. My dad was a golf pro in Spokane, and uh, my mother was a church, church organist in a Lutheran church. So my brother and I were expected to be in church every Sunday, but as I got a little older and had a little more freedom, I would slip into the Catholic cathedral uh, in uh, Spokane. And once I even dared to go into uh, Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church in Spokane, but this, this uh, Scottish uh, guy uh, who has turned into one of the whitest people on the planet, when I walked into that Greek church and I saw a sea of Greeks looking at me in wonderment, I lost my nerve and I didn't get past the narthex. Uh, but um, years later, when I did discover orthodoxy and monasticism, which was almost, a, 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 well, it was certainly, I, I think God called, because I, I walked into a cathedral in San Francisco during graduate school and, uh, and was just sort of blown away by, by what I saw and what I experienced. Uh, so I say that about my Lutheran background because I was not raised uh, with any kind of devotion to the Holy Virgin. About the only time the Virgin might be even mentioned in our, in our family uh, was during um, Christmas season. And, uh, but I, at the same token, I, I, every time I would go into, say, a Catholic church and I would see statues of the Virgin's the Virgin, I would feel very strongly drawn to her. And then once I, uh, actually the very first icon I came into contact with um, was uh, in the home of a friend of mine who was Orthodox and he had a, um, a small um, icon corner in his living room and he had this beautiful icon of the Holy Virgin. And I felt drawn to her and uh, and so she has been, she has played a, a very important role in my own life uh, as a monk and as a Christian, that she is my mother. Yeah. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I feel comforted by her and I know that uh, she uh, responds to my prayers and my requests for help. Uh, I actually had an experience once on Mount Athos with this icon of the Holy Virgin. Wow. Um, I was at the Great Lavra, which is the oldest monastery. It was started in uh, 977, I think, or something like that. And I went out of the monastery uh, to, to walk around the grounds. And on my way back in, uh, a priest friend of mine uh, came up to me just inside the massive doors to this fortified city. And he said, they're about to start a service to the Holy Virgin in this little chapel. 
this icon, uh, probably about four feet wide and five or six feet tall, um, had appeared on a tree in that spot. And when the monks saw it, they took it into the Catholicon, their main temple. And uh, the next day it was missing. And they went looking for it and they found it hung on the tree again. So they moved it back into the cathedral, into the Catholicon. And then it went back to the tree. And finally they decided, well, I guess the Holy Virgin wants to be here. So they built this beautiful little Byzantine church to house her. And so when I walked in, I saw all the monks lined up to venerate the icon. And uh, in traditional, the way of doing that, you bow, you prostrate before the icon, you stand up, you prostrate again, you kiss the base of the icon, and then you step back and prostrate a third time. Well, I, I had been, uh, I had visited nine monasteries during my three weeks on Mount Athos. And uh, it was during the time there seemed to be a lot of German tourists everywhere. And uh, so when I was um, in the chapel where the uh, relics of, of St. Athanasius, uh, the, the Athenite, are interned, I was, there was a room that was like a small uh, library, and it was glass-walled, and they had all of these relics, hundreds and hundreds of relics. So I went in there to venerate the relics, and I had these German tourists who weren't Orthodox, in my way between me and these relics. And it seemed like everywhere I went, I was running into these tourists. So I had just finished telling a friend of mine, I wish, why did they allow these German tourists to come here? They're not even Orthodox. So I went up to venerate this icon and I prostrated down before the icon. And as I went to stand up, I heard a clear message the Holy Virgin spoke to me and she said, you too were a tourist. Wow. And I was, I was overwhelmed. And her voice was so familiar to me that it was as though it was my own grandmother's voice. And wow. I stepped wow. back in shock. And then my second time to prostrate, I didn't even look at the icon. I felt that I was unworthy. And then uh, when I went to kiss the icon, I couldn't even kiss the icon. I kissed the base of, the, of this massive frame around it. And I didn't even look at her. And then I backed off, did my final prostration. And I went to the back of this little temple and I prostrated on the floor with my head to the floor behind a huge pillar. And I stayed there for the entire service to the Holy Virgin. And... Uh, I didn't feel like she was speaking to me in a cross way. It was more like this tenderness of my grandmother saying, I'm really disappointed in you. It, it wasn't like, uh, like a correction. It was more like a reminder. And I was so ashamed. And I cried during the whole time I was in the back of that little church. And when I left, I, I couldn't even explain what had happened to me. It actually took probably a month and a half or more before I was able to even tell anyone what had happened because every time I would try to repeat what had happened, I would break into tears. So this was something that was beyond who I am. This was, this was, a, uh, this was an experience I had with the whole person. And then I found out months later, that this icon not only had in its history moved itself from one place to another, but it had flowed forth tears, which are called a repentance, and myrrh from the hands, which is an outpouring of God's mercy on, upon us, but it had also spoken on occasion to people. And I had never heard of an icon doing that. I had no idea that that was such a thing that would happen. And... Uh, so I have never forgotten that. And I guess I have to say that um, I can't count myself as one of those who's had an apparition of the Holy Virgin appear to him um, 
you know, because of his holiness, it was the opposite. The Holy Virgin had to correct Father Trayvon uh, for uh, forgetting that he too had been a tourist. Father Trifon, the, those words are, are incredible, and I believe that they can be and should be very encouraging to many people that are trying to come closer to God, trying to come closer to the Mother of God. Incredible words. I have maybe one more question, and uh, I'd like to pass it on over to, um, to Father. Um, and it's a really simple one. You can probably answer it in 10 seconds. Uh, I'm aware that you all, um, you all make your own coffee there. Tell me you had medium or dark roast available for sale. We have medium roast available. We have dark roast available. I, I love the dark roast so much that I named it after myself. It's called Abbott's Choice. Wow. Father, I, 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 I've got to tell you, I'm blown away because me, I love dark roast. I'm going to have to get me some of that dark roast. Well, I will also tell you that we have an organic shade grown dark roast that's also available. The dark roast, all of our coffees are made with, in, with a process uh, that where they are low in acid. So one of the things that makes our coffee different from most of the coffee companies in the Seattle area is that ours is one of the lowest in acid. So I can drink Incredible. our coffee black. Most everybody else, I have to doctor it up and turn it into a mocha. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for your words of encouragement, your incredible every your incredible testimony as well. I want to pass it on over now to uh, to Father. I know Father has some great questions for you. What, where where are you priest at, Father? Um, in England. Oh, I'm You're actually a England? right. <laughs> so who is your bishop? Um, Alarion. Oh, yes. Which one, Alarion? Yes. Oh, well, you see, although they. Uh, you're under the Metropolitan Broken. then. <laughs> yes, yes, Wonderful. he's directly my bishop. Well, I love him. Mm -hmm. uh, he was sitting in our oh, library right. yeah, he's visiting he's years good. ago, and we had a snowstorm and a big windstorm, and our power was out. So he and I were sitting in front of our library um, uh, fireplace, and we were drinking a Manhattan that I had made him because he used to be the Bishop of Manhattan. And so as the lights were out and the, the whole interior of our library community room was lit by candles and he looked at me and he said, I feel like I'm in Downton Abbey. <laughs> Very good. Well, I have just one really main question, I think, is of the interest to some viewers is, well, two questions. Well, those two questions. First, what challenges do you think somewhat, you, you've seen novices face or uh, uh, people, not much even novices, um, inquiries into monastic life before we even get to the stage of novice in becoming monks, um, either with you or elsewhere, what do you, what do you think are some of the modern, maybe modern challenges or issues which you think some of the hopefuls are coming up? I think with? one of the most difficult things for those interested in monasticism in this in this age of ours is that so many, <coughs> so many young people have, were raised as single uh, child, in single children in a family. And um, whereas in the past, when there, when a family would have, you know, five, six, seven children or more, those children from the beginning learned how to get along with other kids, with their siblings. And they learned how to be in community, the family. And so now the, the challenge for young people today is how to remain focused uh, on the uh, monastic life of community without uh, selfishness, without uh, being about myself, but about my brothers. Uh, I think that uh, that is a challenge. Um, I also think that never before has the world uh, crept into the life of an average person like it does now. Um, I was in Berkeley about three months ago, Berkeley, California, 
uh, where I went to graduate school. And I, I went into a coffee house that, um, that I had hung out in when I was uh, a student. And uh, the first, the main coffee house that I had been, uh, th that was my sort of living room during my college days, uh, the Cafe Mediterranean was closed. They had, it was now a being turned into a fast food store. So then I went to the north side of the campus near the Graduate Theological Union. And there was another coffee house there that I had also frequented. And I knew the man, he was a Palestinian Orthodox Christian that owned the place. Well, I walked in and what I was shocked to see, instead of students sitting there uh, with their friends, drinking coffee, or sitting there with a stack of books in front of them and studying, I saw a sea of laptops and no one was interacting with one another. And the young man behind the counter that made me my latte, uh, I, I was so startled by it. And I was with my friend, Brother Peter of the Capuchins. And I said, you know what we need to do? We need to sit outside at the, at the little, um, uh, one of the little tables outside because I don't want to be in here. I don't want to look at this. So on our way out, the owner walked in. And he saw me, he says, oh, I haven't seen you in years. And he said, you, did you, you met my son. And I said, oh, is that your son? And he said, yes. And he says, I'm turning over the coffee house to my son because I can't deal with this anymore. Everything has changed. And uh, so when you walk into, uh, when you even see young people sitting in coffee houses, they have their phones in their hands and they're texting. Once I actually, I, I kid you not, I, I witnessed a couple sitting together texting each other. <laughs> Why? I mean, it, it just, I was, I wanted to go shake them. Wake up, wake up. But I knew I would probably be arrested. <laughs> so I didn't. But I did pray for them that God would enlighten them as to the folly of their lifestyle because they're thinking that communication is all about high-tech stuff. And I say that with some, as someone who has seen the importance of the internet and uh, social uh, interaction with other people. I mean, um, I've got over 37,000 Facebook friends right now on my Abbot Trifon Facebook page. And, and, I, and, and even recently when I was um, in the hospital for three days regarding my heart, I had my la a laptop with me so that I could still do my blogs and my podcasts because I feel pressed by God that this is what I am to do. This is my vocation. This is my calling. So I understand the value of it. I remember years ago when I decided to start doing this, uh, Patriarch uh, Kirill of Moscow uh, gave out a, a, sent a, a decree to all of his bishops. He said, if we don't use the internet, only the devil will use the internet. And I took that to heart. And so I, I see this as a, a form of ministry that, uh, that is really needed in our age. And I try to be gentle because I know that especially under this period of time with the pandemic and uh, so many people out of their jobs, both in England, in the United States, in Canada, everywhere, um, people more than ever perhaps are needing to have someone ministering to them on a daily basis. And, and that's one of the reasons why I started doing uh, YouTube videos as well, because I want people to see my face. Um, they'll, feel, they'll feel so much more blessed with the face they have that God has given them if they see my face, is my theory behind this. But I want them to see someone who loves them. And, and my labors are for them, because I know that they're needing all the help they can get during this this terrible time that we're living through in this world. Thank you. Thank you, Father. And 
just a little bit more. Apart from starting young and asking parents to have much many, many more children so that they can grow up in community, if someone is interested in monastic life seriously, what sort of things do you think they could do to help deal with some of these things? Or uh, maybe that, should they go visit a, a few monasteries or come and stay a little while? Or what sort of recommendation would you have on that? Well, it's very important. Um, a monastery, just because you don't fit into one monastery doesn't mean you don't have a monastic vocation because a monastery is a family. Uh, I am one of those that uh, I I could not, I don't think I could be happy in a large monastery of maybe 40 or 50 monks, uh, certainly not as their abbot, <laughs> because I'm also, uh, I have a part of me that is, that loves the, the solitude of my monastic cell. So I spend probably the majority of my waking hours in my cell alone. I have my own um, icon wall, I have my censer, uh, I have my prayer book, I have my, 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 my Bible, I have my spiritual re readings that I'm doing throughout the day. Uh, that is my focus. Uh, and I have a view out my window into the forest. So it's, it's the perfect place for me. But I would also have to say that my time when I spend uh, in the services with my monks, and the time that I spend uh, in fellowship uh, in the uh, in the community room library, um, I've been told that our library is sort of Edwardian on the cheap. It's filled with stuff, and it's all homey stuff. Most of it I found, you know, at garage sales or uh, furniture that's been given to us, or but it, but it's all tastefully done <laughs> because my mom had good taste so i inherited that from my mother but we but the time we have as a community in that library um around the fireplace at this time of year uh is just meaningful it's it's uh, because we are a family and when I visited other monasteries, oh, one of my, uh, our brother monastery is Holy Cross Monastery in West Virginia. Um, Abbot Seraphim and I are, are, are like brothers from a different mother. We love each other. And whenever he's able to come and spend time with us, he does. And whenever I'm able to go there and spend time, I do. Um, but there's, but then, then again, I think that there's this connection um, when I'm in the Bay Area and I go to the North Beach neighborhood, the Italian neighborhood, um, I always go with my friend, Brother Peter of the Capuchins, whose dad grew up in that neighborhood. Brother Peter is an Italian. And, uh, and so for me, being dressed as I am, and Brother Peter, who always wears his, uh, his Capuchin Franciscan robes, always, never out of them, when we go any place together, like in, in a, an Italian restaurant or a coffee house in the North Beach neighborhood, the impact that it has on people that see us together is important. And I, I am one of these, uh, and I know there will be some Orthodox that will be accusing me of being some sort of, a, of an ecumenist. Uh, but, but to me... In these latter days, when Christianity has been so um, maligned throughout the West, and in, you go to England and, and look at how many uh, cathedrals and churches that are now churches that are now empty and closed, or they're being sold off to, to Muslims for use. And where are the young people? Um, I feel that, that these are the times when regardless of the differences that we have as Orthodox and Roman Catholics, and there are many of them, and we need, but we still need to, to work together as the remnant of, Christ, of, of apostolic Christianity. We really need to do that. And, uh, and we need to, you know, I have a lot of Protestant minister friends 
And I'm not preaching to them about the truth of orthodoxy because I really believe that the true evangelism is in our witness of how we live and how we love. And if they can't see the truth of orthodoxy in me, then it's the same way as my parents. My mother was very upset when I became an Orthodox monk. Uh, the first thing she said when I went home to visit was, oh, you're becoming a hippie again. <laughs> because she saw me growing a long beard and long hair. And, and as she said, you're dressing funny and you're wearing things around your neck, my cross. <laughs> And uh, and my and I knew that my mom and dad were not happy as Lutherans uh, because the Lutheran Church had been changing. And I remember my mother told me she missed the old Lutheran liturgy because they were using prayer uh, praise services. Uh, she missed the the um, reverence that they had when they would go into church on a Sunday morning and everybody would slip into the pew in silence and pray. And now it was a gap fest. So what I did is I, I prayed that, to, that God would help me become the very best son I could be to my parents. And, uh, and then one day a priest from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho was passing through our monastery and I asked him if he would deliver a package to my mom. And it was a big box that I had for more than a month, I had been filling it with little individually wrapped Christmas gifts. And just random little things that I knew my, my parents wouldn't spend money on, but that they would enjoy, you know, little gift items like something to eat or, you know, some little knickknack. And I, I finally had the box filled when Father Gregory came through. And I asked him if when he went back to Coeur d'Alene, if he would go to my parents' house and knock on the door and hand that box to my mother. And, and I said, and I want to have the box. I want you to tell my mother that she can take, open the box and take all the gifts that are wrapped in that box and put them under their Christmas tree and not open them till Christmas. And then I said, and the last thing I want you to do is give my mother a hug from me. Within two weeks, my parents were going to Father Gregory's parish. And within a month, they had become catechumens. And then I went to Coeur d'Alene to, to join Father Gregory in baptizing my parents. So, you know, to me, that's proof that it, it, it isn't words or giving people gifts of icons or giving them gifts, oh, read this, you'll be convinced. It's really about them seeing the light of Christ in me and that it's made a difference for me and even how I treat other people. Thank you very much, Father. Well, that was really my questions, and so I'll pass you on to Eric. And you please excuse me, you've been in the UK, it's now past midnight. Oh, so you're... Gentlemen, if you don't um, head off. To Take care, this, Father. Uh, it's a joy to good. meet you. <clears throat> good night, Father Fred. Patrick. All right. Was it John or Patrick? Either. Uh, <laughs> it, Either. It's, <laughs> his, name, his, name, his name upon entry was Patrick, but his birth name is John so, uh, oh, okay. we call him Father. We call him so Father Patrick. <laughs> uh, okay. Is my audio oh. coming through? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Okay, yes, Father Abbott. Father Abbott, thank you so much for uh, coming on here. You know, my question uh, really goes based off of something you just talked about, and uh, I I've posed this question to some of our guests before. And it is an interesting one. Um, what would you say to somebody, and I would, I would include myself in this somebody, um, who finds it very confusing that there are so many people in the world uh, praying for God to give them direction, guidance, to be a light to their feet. And... They're so sincere about it. You know, I, 
I come from a, a vast horizon of experience. I was raised in a Catholic church. I was raised in the Catholic church. Then I became a reformed Baptist in at university. I spent years in the Protestant world. And, and then I traveled into Lutheranism and then spent time in the Anglican church. And now I'm back in the Catholic church. Um, and I can tell you throughout the whole process, there were some very sincere people who thought that they, that Christ had them where he wanted them. And, but, you know, in, in us Catholics and Orthodox, we talk about the one true church and, uh, outside of which there is no salvation. So one of the things that has always you know, always troubled me. And, um, you know, it, it is, is I, I have so many people, friends, acquaintances, family members, even the hosts on the show here, because we have, we have an Orthodox priest, Father Patrick, we have, we even have an atheist uh, host. Um, we have a, a whole bunch of people here. And um, it, it just seems so hard to just, say, well, if they're not in the true church, then that must mean that uh, they're absolutely lost, especially if they're, they've been so sincere for so many years, and then they end up in a different place than, than myself, you know? So, and, and so how, would you, how would you go about talking to somebody who's just like, he doesn't understand why God would allow this kind of diversity if he if he wants the uniformity so much, well, first of all, um, God's grace abounds everywhere. God is everywhere, and His uncreated grace is everywhere. So we can say clearly that. We know where grace abounds, but we don't know where it is not. Um, I remember once I gave a talk in Medford, Oregon, and there were some um, uh, Calvinists in the audience. And one of them asked me that question, you know, is there salvation outside of Christ? And the answer is no, there is no salvation outside of Christ. But because God's grace abounds everywhere and we don't know where it isn't, uh, do we dare say that someone who has lived a life according to their conscience and according to the knowledge that they've been given is going to go to hell? We can't say that. Um, I have truthfully known people in my life that were better Christians than I am and uh, who were not Orthodox. And, um, and so how can I look at them and think, well, I'm Orthodox and they're not, and I have the fullness of truth and they have nothing and uh, good luck. And I can't say that to them. I can say to them, pray for me because I want to be holy. So um, I think what I would tell people is to have your mind and heart open to the truth. I did not ever expect to end my life in this ghetto. You know, I never expected it. I never expected that I would be a monk. I certainly didn't expect that I would be orthodox. And uh, here I am. And so I, I chalk it up to God's grace and mercy. And uh, so that's why I don't feel a need to go out and, and uh, uh, grab people off the street and give them a flyer, you know, and say, do you know Jesus? Because they might say, yes, they do, but maybe they don't. You know, the Lord said that if we don't love 
those that we have seen, how can we love God that we have not seen? And so our, our, as Christians, we have to work hard at loving other people and being merciful to other people and being uh, the light of Christ in other people. <coughs> in the Orthodox Church, whenever we light a lamp, a lampada, before an icon, it's not really about the saint. It's about a recognition that Christ dwells in his saints. And, and we as Christians are to be a light, the light of Christ to the world around us. So if people look at us and don't see the light of Christ emanating from us, then we have failed as Christians. So when we light the lamp in front of an icon, it, it's the light of Christ that we're lighting in recognition that the saint that we're venerating um, is showing forth the light of Christ. Does that answer your question? That's great, Father Abbott. Yeah, that was excellent. I really appreciate you uh, elaborating on that. The, uh, the only other question I'd have is, you know, it piqued my interest when you spoke about your father and how that influenced you. Um, could you name a couple of distinctives that you remember that really made a mark on you and your character? Well, I remember when I turned 50 and I looked in the mirror and I said, oh, my God, I've turned into dad. <laughs> because I have my dad's sense of humor, which sometimes some people probably feel is a little over the top for a monk. But I have my dad's sense of humor. But one of the things that my dad gifted to me is my dad really loved and respected everyone. So I remember when I was a toddler, my dad and mom took me to the uh, Greenbrier Resort in um, uh, uh, West Virginia. And uh, it's where the, the bunker was for the White House. And it's a massive resort. And my dad played golf with President Eisenhower and, and the famous uh, Sam Snead, who was the uh, who was the golf pro there at the time. My dad had friends who were millionaires, and I also remember one of my dad's golfing buddies when we lived in Sandpoint, Idaho. Th this family had a little log cabin house in Sandpoint that was so old that it had a dirt floor with linoleum on top of it. And this guy was one of my dad's golfing buddies. My dad, it didn't matter to my dad whether somebody was well-known or well-healed. He liked people just for the way they were. And so I grew up with a father that, that was like that. I, I grew up with a dad who uh, was um, blind to, differ, to, to color on people, you know, to races. He didn't, and my dad had a huge collection of um, history books on Native American history. He's the only person I ever knew that had a library like that. And, and so I grew up with great love and respect for Native Americans. Um, I got that from my dad. And my dad really loved my brother and I. And he, there wasn't a day that, went, that passed without us knowing my, that our dad loved us. My dad was kind and respectful to my mom. So my dad imaged for brother and I uh, a respect for women and, uh, and not seeing women as somehow below him. This is who my dad was. Um, he just was a good man all around. And I think that really that's really what's important for fathers today with their children, but be it whether they have girls or boys or both, is that they always be there for the children. And, and most important as a Christian, that they image their love of Christ in front of their children. To the man that only makes the sign of the cross when he's entering the church on a Sunday, that man is failing his children. 
because the children need to be able to see in their dad someone who has God first in his life on a daily basis. And so that's what each father has to do with his children. That's excellent. And he has to be so quick to forgive others. My dad did that as well. My dad was one who, if somebody stabbed him in the back, uh, he really, he never, he, he always forgave them. Even if they didn't ask forgiveness, he always forgave them. He always saw the good in other people, even when they weren't uh, imaging goodness to him. So I'm really proud that I, I'm, I'm so happy that I got to, to tell my dad before he died how much I appreciated what he gifted to me as, a, as his son. My mother was the same. Wow, that is amazing. That's so good to hear. Um, well, Father Abbott, I think we've uh, we've taken your time quite a bit here, but we've been blessed each moment. Um, so, Michael, if you want to take it from here, I think I'm finished. Yeah, we we just had a few live questions, and then uh, we'll we'll go ahead and uh, end it in just a few. But if y'all wanted to call, uh, I could maybe take one call. One eight hundred four eight four three eight zero one. I put the number in the chat. One eight hundred four eight four three eight zero one. If you want to call uh, Abbott Trefon with your live question, otherwise I have a couple here in the chat. Uh, this one is from. Uh, Marina or Marina, not sure how to pronounce. I have a question. How do you know for certain that your vocation from God is the monastic life and not something else like a missionary? Well, I'm, well, lucky for me in orthodoxy, um, the monastic life uh, is quite wide open to different possibilities. So, for instance, uh, when I was in Greece, uh, there were monastery. There was one monastery that ran a a, a very large uh, Orthodox bookstore in Athens. Um, there are monasteries in in Russia and England that uh, that that take care of the elderly in in rest homes. Uh, there's all kinds of things that they do. Um, there are um, monks that are parish priests. Uh, and, and this is just particularly a vocation that I feel God called me to do. But it wasn't that way for most of my monastic life. This has just been probably the last 11 years or so of my 40-some years as a monk. Uh, this one is from Teresa. If a monastery is a hospital for sinners, why does it seem like there's an expectation to already be spiritually healthy, even exceptionally so, in order to be admitted? Well, I think that that is a great mistake. And I think that anyone who would sort of try to shove that uh, out on someone who's looking into orthodoxy, they need to look closely at themselves because uh, we are all in need of healing. And uh, none of us, have, we've all, as St. Paul said, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. St. Paul even said of himself that he was the greatest of sinners. Paul, the greatest of sinners. None of us would think of that when we think of Paul, but Paul said that of himself. So, you know, to me, there's no one that could come to me and tell me anything that would make me want to turn my back on them and tell them, come back when you're holy. I mean, what is the church for? It's a, it's a hospital for the soul. So this is where people that are sinners, even great sinners, need to be. And if we who are in that hospital for ourselves to be made whole and healed, we, we dare not do that. It would be in orthodoxy we see uh, as the priests, as the therapists within that hospital of the soul. And, you know, what kind of a doctor would you be in, a, in, in, say, a, uh, a cancer ward, if somebody showed up and say, oh, excuse me, but can I come in? I have cancer. And you say, oh, well, I'm sorry, but we don't want your kind here. We don't dare do that. 
And anyone that would even expect somebody to be holy before they even came into the church doesn't know what the church is, doesn't understand the role of the church. Hmm. I saw a sign once on a Protestant church, and I'll never forget this. Um, it said, uh, you say this place is filled with hippies, with hipsters. No, wait a minute. You say this place is filled with hypocrites. There's still room. <laughs> I like that. Uh, this one is from Will Martin. How can we help foster the monastic life in our homes with many little children that don't exactly like to sit quietly? <laughs> Uh, we had a family visit us from the south, from North North Carolina, uh, a few months, about a month ago, and they had the th three most adorable little kids. And the last time they were here, one of them came dressed as a monk. He had his little monk outfit on. It was the cutest thing. Um, I remember early on. I was in an Orthodox church, and there was this little boy who just wouldn't settle down. And it was like I kept thinking, why is his mother not controlling him? Why is he not in the back of the church with her arm clasped around his throat? It just irked me that he was always making noise and he was always moving around. But we had the, but the service before Great Lent of a Forgiveness Sunday. And in the Forgiveness Sunday service, everyone comes up to the priest, the priest prostrates before them, and they prostrate to the priest and they say, um, forgive me for any hurt or offense I have caused you in any way. And the person says to the priest, God forgives. Forgive me for any hurt or offense I have caused you in any way. So I'm in line for this. And this, all of a sudden, here's this little rug rat right in front of me, this little boy, and he prostrates in front of me. And he, I, I had to say it first. I said, please forgive me for any hurt offense I have caused you in any way. And as I stood up, this little boy who's prostrating down in front of me, kind of tries to say those words, but it's not coming out in the order that it should be, but he's still saying it. And it just hit me. Oh, my gosh. This little boy has asked me forgiveness, and I have asked him forgiveness for having been upset with him. And I just had tears well up in my eyes. I felt like, oh, my gosh, this is the gospel. And um, so then I started having a more gentle response to both that little boy and the other little kids. And the one thing that sticks in my mind about this little boy is that during the epiclesis, the calling down of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts to make them become the bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, and everybody in that particular parish would do a full prostration at that moment. And this little boy did too, but he was always doing the prostration in the wrong direction because he was imitating everybody else. And in order to imitate them, he had to see what they were doing. And it was, so all of a sudden, it was not an occasion for irritation. It was an occasion for joy that this little boy is learning from all the people around him how to worship before the throne of God. And kids have a lot to, to teach us. The Lord himself said, suffer the little children to come unto me. And sometimes we interpret the suffering in a different way than the Lord meant. But they're children and we have to love them. I remember one cute little thing. Uh, there was a couple that visited us from Southern California. And the mother told me that every day when she'd put her little boy down for his nap, she'd play 
um, the morning offering a podcast with me talking. And so when they arrived, this little boy, when they were coming into the plaza and I came out to meet them, this little boy looked up at, at me and he said to his mother, it's the voice. He recognized my voice because I was always the voice that he'd heard when he was taking a nap. And then a little later, I'm sitting on the veranda of our trapeza with his mom and dad and grandpa and grandma. And this little boy is out uh, in one of our yards picking dandelions. And then he comes up with his little bouquet of dandelions. And thank God his grandfather saw what was about to happen and he took a picture of, of this little boy with this little smile looking up at me and giving me this little bouquet of dandelions. Oh my gosh. I mean, it was the most beautiful gift I've been given in years from this little boy. And so children learn to love God in imitation of the adults around them. And if they see the dad at home uh, arguing with his wife uh, or uh, using foul language when his football team is lost on the television, that little child is listening to that and he's seeing that in juxtaposition to his dad in church looking so pious. And, and then the little boy is not taking church seriously because his dad isn't taking it seriously. So the, the divine liturgy is, is to, meant to be transformational. And when we are in our homes or out in the community, we need to imitate, image Christ. We need to give witness to Christ and the centrality of the Lord in our lives. And if we don't do that, we're failing our children. And we're failing our neighbors. Last one here also uh, from the same question earlier. As a monk, you probably seem, uh, you, you are probably seen as very righteous and holy by others. Uh, even as a layperson, sometimes we struggle with the temptation of religious pride. So how do you deal with that as a monk? Oh, God. I know myself too well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Lord. You know, um, I, you know, it's probably, you know, that when people greet an Orthodox priest, they kiss his hand. But it's not his hand they're kissing. It's Christ's hand. Because he touches the holy mysteries on the altar. Uh, I have, in my 75 years, I, I know myself very well. And a good much of the time, I'm just sort of like, oh my gosh, I've been a monk this many years, and I still am not holy. And I'm still falling short of the glory of God. So uh, it's that knowledge that I guess, I mean, how could one be prideful in that? Well said. If you um, know how, tell me. Maybe I could. Oh, no. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. No, I mean, I, I, you know, I was on an airplane once coming back from New York and this, and I, and the steward came up to me and he said, are you Abbot Trifon? And I said, yes. And he says, oh, I, I, um, I thought so. He says, I've, I've watched a lot of your YouTube videos. And uh, and then he took a selfie with me. Now, how many times have I flown in my 75 years and had any sort of students want a selfie with me? Well, I found it rather humorous, personally. Uh, but I also know myself well enough to know that um, that the, the respect and love that people are showing to me because of my blogs and podcasts 
has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the Lord that I serve, Jesus Christ. And, and I'm just sort of like, uh, kind of like a mist. I saw a, a bottle of wine recently that somebody had in their home that that had the label you couldn't even read it it was it had been uh, left outside or something and the label was all er eroded and it looked awful and they said oh but the bot the wine inside is one of the best wines there is and i think that that's kind of the way it is with us that that uh, we're sort of housing the holy spirit in this dumbed down bottle of wine that that, is, that looks that would not sell on a bookshelf or in a book in a uh, wine shop because of the label, it looks so bad. But we're missing the fact that within that bottle is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and that's really what it's about: being a Christian, let alone being a monk. Abba Trifon, there's so many more questions uh, I'd love to ask, but um, you're, we're running out of time here. So I want to give you the opportunity to maybe put in a plug for anything else that you're, um, you would like to make viewers and listeners aware of. Are you working on a, a book or anything else that we should be aware of right now? Oh, I've had so many people ask me if I'm coming out with another book. And, you know, periodically I start writing a book and then I ended up I end up turning it into a blog article. I don't know. You know, I'm old. <laughs> and uh, I'm just trying to keep myself moving. Some days the arthritis is worse than others. And some days the old pump isn't working the way it should. And I'm waking up and I'm surprised and I'm thinking, you know, it, 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 it. once I had actually somebody – was here taking a photo and they had a flash. And I saw this flash of light and I thought, oh, here it comes. This is my end. And then I realized it was a flash bulb. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a joy being with all of you. It, it has. And, it, and I apologize if I interrupted there uh, uh, earlier. We were getting a little bit of a, a delay, so it was coming through a little late on my end. Um, at least on my end, it's cutting in and out a little bit. I, I don't know if that's happening for you too, Eric. So I apologize if there was some. Well, I'm often late, so we don't need to work. Is this going to be uh, Is this going to be available beyond today? It, it will. It's it's going to be on YouTube indefinitely. Uh, so, in fact, I can send you a link okay. to it. You know, as soon as uh, the show is over, it, it'll be posted on YouTube right away. So, okay. um, you know, we have people watching live. Link. Yeah, but I'll, I'll send you the link. Uh, if I look as well, if I if I come across too terrible in this link, then I'll I'll just have to drink heavily the next time I'm off island. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this was excellent. And, and, uh, By the way, I put myself graduate school as a bartender in an Irish pub. <laughs> we have to talk about that. I, I want to have you on again. We need to discuss this. Boy, he had a lot of work to do, and he still does. <laughs> well, I have a tree fund. I, I, I loved having you on. You're welcome on the show anytime. Thank you, Father. Thank you Thank for your blessing. You. Thank you. And, and again, you're welcome on anytime. Viewers, thank you all for watching and for participating. Don't forget to check out uh, Abbott Trieflin's um, uh, blog and also his show on Ancient Faith Radio. I'll put a link to those. And also go and support the monks there with their coffee and other things on their website. I also included that in the link. So everybody check for that. But once again, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. And also check us out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you would like to support us. Until next time, God bless you all.